Good afternoon. My name is Terry Miller, and I'm the Pharmacology Toxicology Supervisor in the Division of Anti-Effective Products at the FDA. I'd first like to thank the organizers of this conference and our moderator, Ursula, for the invitation to come speak with you. Today, I plan to provide a regu regulatory perspective on the challenges or pitfalls typically encountered in a review of the non-clinical developmental programs. I would like to begin my presentation with an introduction into non-clinical development from a toxicology perspective, discuss the current farm tox requirements for a successful streamlined and non-clinical program, provide examples of non-clinical issues encountered in early and late development, and conclude with some overall recommendations. As you may know, the drug review process is a complex, multidisciplinary, stepwise, pro stepwise process involving evaluation of animal and human safety and efficacy data. The Farm Tox Reviewer assesses the non-clinical safety data submitted by the sponsors. Efficacy data, particularly in animal models of disease, are reviewed by other disciplines on the review teams. The focus of the toxicology review is to provide hazard identification with recommendations on clinical monitoring. In our assessment of non-clinical studies to support first in human dosing, we typically ask ourselves the following questions. Is the non-clinical approach reasonable? Is the first in human starting dose safe? What are the most likely toxicities expected in the clinic based on animal findings? Are these toxicities reversible? And has the sponsor identified an optimal dosing schedule and study duration in animals that adequately supports the clinical trials? The good thing is that there are many non-clinical guidances to help advise you on your non-clinical development programs. The principal guidances are the ICH guidances that were negotiated and agreed upon by several international regulatory agencies, including the FDA. The most important non-clinical guidance bolded is ICH M3R2, Non-Clinical Safety Studies for the Conduct of Clinical Trials, which describes the type, duration, and timing of non-clinical studies. In determining the non-clinical data that you can rely on for your submissions, we generally make the distinction between the investigational new drug application and the new drug application or marketing application. For the IND, you may rely on studies that you conduct, published publish literature and published databases, the summary basis of approval for other FDA-approved products, and drug monographs. However, these sources must contain sufficient details to base an independent safety decision. For marketing applications, you may rely on any studies you conduct and publish literature, FDA labels for other products, which we will review for adequacy. The FDA summary basis of approvals and any other FDA advisor committee materials and non-USA regulatory assessments cannot be relied upon. Full reports of investigations of safety are required to be submitted in the, in the NDA for marketing approval. Overall, a good non-clinical package at the time of NDA submission would consist of a pharmacodynamic assessment, safety pharmacology studies, single and repeat dose toxicology studies, genetic and reproductive toxicology studies, carcinogenicity assessments if they are deemed necessary, and any special toxicity studies such as immunotoxicity or phototoxicity assessments. It should be noted with the exception of the pharmacodynamic studies, all pivotal non-clinical studies should be conducted GLP. You should keep in mind that not all of these studies need to be completed before your first in human trial. As described in the ICH guidance M3R2, there are certain studies that are required at each stage of clinical development before the next stage of clinical development can be initiated. For example, Prior to the first in human phase one trial, we typically would like to see a safety pharmacology core battery, single and or repeat dose toxicity studies in at least two species, rodent and non-rodent, in vitro gene tox assessments, tissue cross-reactivity studies for biologic products, and qualification of any novel excipients in the clinical formulation. Prior to start of phase two, for example, Additional repeat dose toxicology studies that better match the intended clinical duration and exposure, if changed, 
may be needed, along with an in vivo genetic toxicology assessment to round out the GeneTox core battery. Prior to phase three, fertility studies and embryo fetal development studies in at least two species, rodent and non-rodent, and any juvenile animal studies are typically recommended, as well as a discussion of the impurities and chemistry issues with, final, with the final products. Also by this time, completion of the PK ADME assessments in animals should be submitted for review. And finally, at the time of NDA submission, the peripostnatal development toxicity study should be completed, as well as any carcinogenicity studies, if needed. Carcinogenicity studies for drugs to treat serious and life-threatening illnesses may be accepted post-marketing, but we ask that the studies be initiated at the time of NDA submission. As mentioned, the most pivotal non-clinical studies required to support early clinical trials are the single and repeat dose animal toxicology studies. In these studies, we typically look for the following. Are, this, are the single dose or multiple do dose studies needed to support the clinical trial? Are the planned treatment durations and anticipated clinical exposures covered in these animal studies? What are the target organs for toxicities in animals? And is there a dose response for these effects? And what is the maximum tolerated dose, the no observed adverse effect level, and no observed effect level values identified in these studies? And most importantly, are these effects reversible? For biologic products, toxicity studies should be conducted in two pharmacologically relevant species. If no relevant species exists, then transgenic animals or homologous proteins should be considered. The biologic products we most typically see in our division are monoclonal antibodies directed against foreign targets, say a bacterial toxin, and in these cases a short-term toxicity study in a single species, preferably a rodent, is acceptable. No reproductive toxicity studies are required. For all biologic products, gene tox and carcinogenicity studies, generally these studies are not needed for biologic products. In the animal studies, you should characterize any antibody response to determine if these responses are neutralizing to the product. You should also consider any PK or ADME differences in animals that may require a change in dose frequency and treatment duration in animals. While juvenile animal studies may help address pediatric concerns not addressed by clinical or tox studies in adult animals, the need for such studies to support a pediatric indication is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. You should plan to provide scientific justification for why they are or are not needed. Juvenile studies are typically conducted in one species, preferably rodent. Non-rodent species may be appropriate with scientific justification. In your studies, consider the indication, the age, the extent and timing of dosing, and any PKPD differences the corresponding developmental stages, and the specific target organs identified in the adult toxicity studies. There is an increased risk of toxicity to organ, organ systems that undergo considerably, considerable postnatal growth, and toxicity in these organs are typically the reason why such studies might be recommended. The need and timing of combination toxicology studies are dependent on the availability of safety data for each product. Combination toxicology studies are typically conducted in a single relevant species of equal duration to the clinical trial, not to exceed 90 days. It is generally considered that for any two drugs intended for use only in combination, or when the non-clinical data is lacking for each drug alone, combination tox studies should be conducted prior to the clinical trials. Similarly, Two early stage drugs or drugs with a low margin of safety, similar targets of toxicity, or when the adverse effects are difficult to monitor in the clinic, the combination studies should be done early in development. For early, for early stage entities with clinical experience, combined with late stage entities, or when two late stage entities with no combination experience are combined, combination toxicity, toxicity studies can be delayed until later in development. 
In general, combination talk studies are recommended for all later stage trials, longer duration trials, and for marketing combination products, with the exception of two late stage or approved drugs with prior clinical combination experience. There are many common obstacles encountered during our non-clinical assessments that can derail or delay a program. These include incorrect types and timing of non-clinical studies to support the clinical trial, when the no observed adverse effect level of target organs are not correctly identified in the animal studies, and when the length of the non-clinical studies does not match or exceed the intended clinical use. When pivotal studies are not GLP, and when there are issues related to changes in the formulation late in development that results in precipitation or changes in the PK ADME or toxicity profile. Also, sometimes the toxicity of the excipients alone or the inactive ingredients have not been adequately assessed. This may occur with new or novel excipients or when there's a new route of administration. We typically ask that in these cases, the final clin clinical formulation be tested in the non-clinical studies by the same route and duration as proposed in humans. Another common problem is when impurities are not adequately qualified in the animal studies. This might occur when batches used in the non-clinical studies fails to contain the impurity in question. Insufficient reproductive tox batteries can sometimes prevent initiation of phase three trials and NDA approval. Because carcinogenicity testing can take two years to complete, their needs should be addressed early in development. I would now like to provide some examples of early and late non-clinical issues that in our estimation slowed a clinical program. First case was for a new molecular entity drug for a chronic indication. The drug caused mortality in several dogs treated for 14 days consecutively. It was associated with cardiac defects and seizures. Histopathology of the brain and heart proved inconclusive. However, there were significant QTC, QTC effects noted. The drug was shown to accumulate in the heart, brain, and lungs at five times greater than plasma levels. The sponsor was placed on full clinical hold and was required to conduct a tissue distribution study and a 90-day dog toxicology study, which, which they were able to identify a no observed effect level for both toxicities. The sponsor was allowed to proceed with their trial, and several healthy volunteers immediately developed CNS adverse effects after just a few doses, and product development was discontinued. In the next example, also this product was an enemy, was a novel protein targeted to a bacterium. Four weekly IV doses to dogs caused inflammation, decreased blood pressure, and reflex tachycardia after the third or fourth dose. The animal showed evidence of a type one hypersensitivity or anaphylactic response. Also, seven day rat and dog toxicology studies with a three week recovery period showed adventitial inflammation, increased heart and lung weights, and damage to arterioles, particularly in the lung. It was suspected that both type 1 and type 2 hypersensitivity reactions were occurring in these animals. The sponsor was placed on full clinical hold and required to conduct an animal sensitization study. The third case was for a topical gel formulation of an approved drug with a new route of administration for a five-day treatment of full thickness burn wounds. Preliminary studies in affected animals with full thickness wounds limited to less than seven days showed evidence of e efficacy and early evidence of healing. However, these animal studies used different excipients than in the clinical formulation, and the local skin toxicity and wound healing was not adequately assessed. So we noted that the systemic toxicity of the active pharmaceutical ingredient was not a concern as the API was approved for, our, for oral administration. The sponsor is placed on, on full clinical hold and was required to conduct a GLP study in an unaffected full thickness burn wound model with the final clinical formulation administered topically to cover the full clinical duration of treatment. 
I would now like to describe three cases where non-clinical deficiencies were noted late in development and impacted the NDA submission and review. The first case was for a new molecular entity, oral and IV drug to treat an acute infection. The sponsor needed to rely on older pivotal animal studies conducted decades ago to qualify for several product impurities. It was determined that the impurity profiles in these non-clinical lots tested in these early studies were not adequately characterized. And also there was marked emesis noted or vomiting noted in the dogs throughout the study likely affected the plasma levels. The sponsor was then required to conduct an additional 28-day rat toxicology study with enriched impurity levels to qualify these impurities before they submitted their NDA. The second example was for a new molecular entity drug for acute infection that involved a late formulation change just prior to phase three and long after the non-clinical studies were completed. The late formulation change included a new excipient known to increase absorption of some drugs up to 50-fold. The sponsor conducted a two-week IV bridging toxicology study in rats which showed no differences in PK or toxicity profile. It was noted, however, that the reproductive toxicology studies were conducted with the prior formulation. The sponsor was required to conduct an additional fetal distribution study in pregnant animals with the new formulation as well as an additional embryo fetal development study prior to submitting their application. The third and final example was for an oral antibiotic to treat a chronic parasitic infection. The standard battery of non-clinical studies were submitted to support NDA approval. It was noted that the reproductive toxicology studies conducted back in the 1970s lacked evaluation of several key developmental milestones in animals. Therefore, the applicant was required to conduct a reproductive toxicology study in alignment with current standards defined in the ICH guidances. In this case, we did agree to accept the study post-marketing because of the indication. However, had we not agreed to this late submission, the need for this study could have impacted marketing approval. In my overall recommendations, I would like to mention that non-clinical drug development is a complex process guided by ICH and FDA guidances and prior division experience with similar products. Because of this, the process cannot be streamlined with appropriate guidance from the division and by toxicology consultants with knowledge of the process. We highly recommend you seek advice on your non-clinical developmental approach as early as possible. We suggest a pre-IND consultation with the division, but do come ready to discuss your non-clinical approach and any data that you may have. We are willing to review pivotal animal study protocols before you initiate your studies but do provide us with at least six weeks to review and comment on the protocols. I sincerely appreciate your time and attention today. And again, I would like to thank Ursula and the Eschmid organizers for the invitation to come speak with you. I provided my email address as well as contact information in the division for whom you can address any questions that you may have. Thank you.